do know like with it, repeated exposures of things like you can develop more allergens you can develop more sensitization the more you mix products and ingredients the more likely you are to develop uh like long-term allergens that you'll react to products forever for example like i'm allergic to hair dye i started dyeing white hairs it was fine for like the first six months and then i developed an allergen to because a lot of people think well i've been using a product forever i'm not going to develop an allergy it's actually the opposite and the more you mm -hmm. use a product the more likely you are to develop an allergen Welcome back to Skin Disease, the podcast. Today on the show, we have Dr. Muneeb Shah. He has over 22 million followers across all of his platforms, and you probably know him as Derm Doctor. He's kind of the doctor of social media, the dermatologist. He has so many good videos. I remember finding him years and years ago before I was even in dermatology, and there's so much fascinating information in his content. And he really helps to debunk a lot of the myths that we see across social media today, a lot of the crazy trends that we see. We talk about everything in this episode from Botox in a bottle to irritation with ingredients like niacinamide and vitamin C and what we can do about that. We talk about remedies for dark spots, for sebaceous filaments. He is a double board certified dermatologist and Mohs surgeon, so he has so much to say on many of these topics, so much great advice. And he is also the CEO and founder of a new skincare brand called Remedy. So we talk a little bit about his remedies for different skin concerns, and I know you guys are gonna love this episode. So without further ado, here is Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for being here on the show. I like to start every podcast with asking my guests, what is your first skincare memory? Ooh, my first skincare memory would probably be proactive. I had acne as a teenager and I saw all the commercials for proactive. They worked very, very well on me. And I made my mom go out and get me the set. And I remember it smelled a particular way mm -hmm. and it's ingrained in my brain. I remember it made my skin peel and it made my skin very, very dry. Those are probably the, that's my probably my first skincare memory. It's funny, that's a really common one, and so is Clinique, the Clinique three-step. Those seem to be ingrained in our brains in our generation. It's so funny. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because I didn't really, I always, I you know, was one of those people who early on as a male got into appearances and hygiene <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. early on. Uh, I was really into my haircuts when I was younger, mm -hmm. And my sister like tweezed my eyebrows when I was maybe 12. And then I was committed to getting my eyebrows done since then. And so I always wanted to have nice skin. So it was something I always cared about, but I found it way more confusing than hair care or just getting your eyebrows you know, threaded. So, so that's been my skincare journey starting there. So do you think that had something to do with your desire to go into dermatology? No, you know, I, I think the dermatology, I, I initially did not go into dermatology. I actually specialized in radiology first, mm -hmm. which is, you know, looking at images, x-rays, MRIs, CAT, CT scans for those who are listening. And I did that for about two years and I realized it wasn't a good fit for me. And so I, I switched and I actually applied for dermatology residency afterwards and didn't realize how much I loved it until, until I, I thought the idea of like personal hygiene, personal appearances and like my career was sort of separate and now they're connected. So it's like both my passion and my job, which has worked out really well. I feel that way as well. So when you switch to dermatology, I mean, we've spoken to a lot of dermatologists on this show and I know this from speaking to them and also from speaking to my colleagues that there isn't really a lot of skin care education in your in dermatology, right? Like Because dermatology is such a vast field of medicine Maybe it's a little bit different now, but it seems like in the past there wasn't a lot of skincare education. So when you went into dermatology, were you already going in with the mindset that eventually you wanted to be kind of a skincare expert or did you still find it separate at that point until you started practicing and realizing that there was a lot of overlap there? Yeah, we don't get, you know, specific education around like they don't do like a course on like what is niacinamide, right. but I would say of all the specialties, I mean, we certainly get the most skincare education. Of course. We, we, we get a lot of samples and we get a lot of products and we get a lot of patients who ask us about skincare. So even though it's not really part of our core curriculum in the sense that, you know, we're, we're having like lectures on skincare products specifically and how they're formulated, 
because it's a question you're gonna get the first day of your residency people are gonna ask you like oh can you tell me what moisturizer to get or what sunscreen because they because the, the 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 public perceives you as somebody who has expertise in skincare and so you're almost forced to learn so it was actually my first day of residency it's sort of interesting where my one of my the people who was training me his name's dr cook and he told me you know people are going to ask you uh what to put on their skin sunscreens moisturizers cleansers right because you're going to prescribe the active ingredients so they're going to ask you about which skincare products and which brands to choose from. And so he's like, you have to try a bunch of products and we'll give you a bunch from the sample closet and you have to come up with your own recommendations. He's like, I suggest you start with CeraVe because it's something that I like and, you know, take these products home, use them in your own routine so that you can feel knowledgeable when you recommend them to your patients. And that was my first introduction to CeraVe. And then it wasn't until like two two years later that I became an ambassador uh, for CeraVe. So it was sort of an interesting, like, story arc with that beginning but you're kind of forced as a dermatologist to learn about skincare because if you're not knowledgeable about it you're every single patient interaction you're going to feel ill-equipped to talk to your patient so uh, it's sort of it's not part of your curriculum but you're sort of forced to by the nature of the job and we get so many products at our conferences you've probably been to some of them so you know you're testing and trying and reading all the research that comes from those skincare brands when they come out with new technologies Do you think that that's something that's going to change moving forward in the curriculum? Do you think there's going to be more of a focus on skincare just with the way that the world is moving towards that subject matter so much more? Yeah, I don't know that it will become part of our traditional curriculum. So our curriculum is really more targeted when we talk about like lectures because dermatology is a very lecture heavy field. Like we dedicate an entire day of the week in residency to just learning and education. So it's four days on the job and then one day like straight up reading. That's generally how most residency programs work. Now those lectures are targeted towards our board exam. And I don't foresee a situation where there's going to be a heavy testing on skincare ingredients and formulations on our actual board exam. So I don't think that core curriculum will change. I think that Derm residents in general will have much more knowledge about skincare um, because of all the content that's available on social media all the YouTube videos that are out there, the fact that now skincare brands are looking to dermatologists to be ambassadors for the brands um, and to test and be part of these advisory boards, I think that every derm resident is going to be exposed. Like you wouldn't believe if you go to our derm conferences nowadays how much the skincare brands have infiltrated our, 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 our conferences. And so as a result of that, I think that that education will be, it would almost be like extracurricular But I think that the knowledge of an average dermatologist on skincare will be far more than it was in the past. Yeah. And as the next generation of dermatologists come in who have grown up in this world of social media where they're already receiving that skincare education, I'm sure the interest will be higher. So there will be a lot more self-learning when it comes to skincare. Absolutely. And there's a lot of brands that are sort of leading that charge. You know, Skin Fix, Alta MD. CeraVe, La Roche-Posay all have very robust resident programs. And so they're getting a lot of secondary education. Even SkinCeuticals, when I was a resident at the time, they used to do these webinars where if you listen to the webinar on the technology, they would send you free product. And, you know, getting $160 free product as a resident, I mean, you're on you're on the come up. So, yeah. so I, I, it was always there. I, it's more than ever, though, now. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you approach your own patients in clinic when you're prescribing a prescription regimen? Do you formulate an entire skincare regimen from start to finish for them as it pertains to the actives that they'll be using? Yeah, so I do. And, and, and that might be just like sort of selection bias of the patients that come in to see me because a lot of them are expecting like a full routine because <laughs> they've either found me on social media or they have that expectation, right, that they are going to get a full routine. So traditionally, I think um, the way that it works in a dermatology office is that like you have your you know, tretinoin, your prescription tretinoin, or you have your prescription actives for acne or rosacea that you're going to prescribe. And then you give some samples from the sample closet. And it still really works like that for me. You know, patients will come in and I'll kind of write out a regimen for them where it's like, I want you to use this cleanser. I think it's going to work well for you. Here's some samples. Try it. See if you like it. If you like it, buy the bigger size of it. I'm going to prescribe you something. And then here's the sunscreens and and moisturizers that I like. Try them. Pick one that you like because you're not going to like necessarily everything that I like. Mm -hmm. So you have to try things and figure out what you're going to like. So I like the minis. I'm a big fan of sending, giving like mini samples, sachets to to our patients so that they can choose. Um, we also have this program called AIR where you can electronically recommend skincare 
to patients in the office and they basically get an email summary of the products that you recommend for them and they can either check out through air but the nice thing about it is it has pictures of the products so they can also go to amazon and you know it's discounted on air but on on amazon if they're more comfortable with that they can just it's it's just a nice way to instead of having them write a paper that they lose which happens often mm-hmm. it's just a way to like have an electronic document of what you recommended in the office yeah it's nice to have something to refer back to i think especially when you're getting so much education in office it can be hard to remember everything and as you said it's written down which is nice but sometimes being able to see the products and remember what they look like is helpful we do something similar in our office too Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit. You are kind of the doc on TikTok, and you really talk about a lot of really interesting topics and kind of debunk a lot of myths. So I want to talk a a little bit about some of the most common social media trends we're seeing in skincare right now and kind of get your take on them. Okay, cool. Amazing. Yeah. So let's start with tween skincare. This is a super hot topic. Do tweens and teens need a skincare routine? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah, there's this this kind of middle ground where you see there's like an excitement right from a dermatology angle. You're like, wow, like all these kids are using skincare. This is good. They're they're taking care of their skin or thinking about their skin. This is, this could be a good thing. And then you see the t- the videos on TikTok and you're like, whoa, this is definitely not a good thing. Uh, I remember the first video that I saw it showed up on my feed. It must have been a girl who was maybe like 14 or so. Huge back like bathroom. So I, I don't know, you know, what, what her background is, but she had a, a much larger bathroom than I did. <laughs> and it's like 12, 12 step skincare routine, every toner essence that you could think of. And I'm like, this is too much. And we do know like with it, repeated exposures of things, like you can develop more allergens, you can develop more sensitization. The more you mix products and ingredients, the more likely you are to develop uh, like long-term allergens that you'll react to products forever. For example, like I'm allergic to hair dye, mm-hmm. um, which I'm going like completely gray at a, a younger age. <laughs> it's just not ideal, but I didn't know until I started dying or like, you know, touching up like white, like white hairs. It was fine for like the first six months. And then I developed an allergen to, cause a lot of people think, well, I've been using a product forever. I'm not going to develop an allergy. It's actually the opposite. And the more you mm-hmm. use a product, the more likely you are to develop an allergen. So that's the issue when you're using products at such a young age, you're just getting more and more exposures, more and more sensitization, and then more and more issues with products later on in your life when you truly need them. And so my recommendation for teenagers is sunscreen. When you're outside, it's a really good habit to build, just like brushing your teeth. Then you'll need a cleanser to remove that sunscreen when you get home, and then maybe a moisturizer just to keep your barrier hydrated. So if you're a teenager and you're interested in skincare, you're probably going to have the best skin in your life at the age that you're at, unless you're already developing acne. Three-step skincare routine is probably the best path forward for you. Yeah. And I think those recommendations too, like all kind of surround the sunscreen recommendation, right? Because the best thing that you can do at that age is use a daily sunscreen. And then if you're using a daily sunscreen, you really need to cleanse it off and then moisturize. So I love that. I think, I think that's also a really simple routine that anybody who's just getting started in skincare can do as well. Right. I I completely agree with that. You know, just because you're a teenager doesn't, you know, just because you're an adult doesn't mean you have to overcomplicate it either. I mean, really, I truly believe that most people who feel overwhelmed with skincare, like I did when I first started approaching skincare, you could do what I just described, which is have three products and you would have great skin for a really long time. Um, Cause most of the issues that you're gonna see is due to the environment and sun exposure. And so if you just did those things, like you wouldn't have like the, the most glowy skin. You wouldn't have the most dewy skin in the world, you know? I don't know if you follow James Welsh on, on, on YouTube. Mm-hmm. He's got perfect skin. Like you're not going to have James Welsh skin using that, that routine, but you'll have like really good skin that people mm-hmm. will point out to you that your skin looks young just using those three products alone. Yeah, absolutely. So next topic that I'm seeing a lot of talk on on social media is needleless Botox. And I think there's really, as we... I don't know if you've noticed this in your practice, but I think that cosmetic procedures are changing a lot right now and people are a little bit more fearful of things that they have been doing regularly. And I think, you know, as providers, as injectors, we have to kind of grow with the times. And I'm seeing a lot more on social media about about people looking for alternatives to Botox. And I'd love to hear your take on that. Is there anything that comes close topically? (laughs) Yes, good question. The only thing that's Botox is is Botox and the Botox alternatives, right? The Xeomins, the Juvos, the the Disports of the world. Like they're the only ones that perform that well, and they perform phenomenally well. I can't understand. This is this is probably understated. It is the procedure, cosmetic procedure across the board, whether you look at plastic surgery on the body, the face, 
any laser, any other treatment, the, the Botox and neuromodulators in general have the highest patient satisfaction rate of any cosmetic procedure. So they work phenomenally well. The risk is relatively low. You know, there are side effects and we can talk about them if people want to get into it, but the risk is relatively low with this procedure and people are generally really, really happy. Now, you'll see a lot of videos online where it's like Botox in a bottle and you're like, well, it's definitely not Botox in a bottle. I mean, probably the closest ingredient to to like a Botox in the bottle would be our Geraline. It has good data that can penetrate the skin and help relax muscle dynamic wrinkles and then eventually kind of even out static wrinkles. And I've, I've tried it and it actually works much better than I anticipated that it would. And there's some good data that it, you can maybe get a little bit more out of your, like, let's say that you get Botox every three months. Maybe if you're using Argerly and you can go every four months, you know, five months, right? And you kind of extend um, the, the amount of time between Botox. Um, but I, I don't think it's like, a, like the, the difference, like I would say Botox performs like 10 times better let's right. say if we were going to quantify how well it works, but it does work to some extent. And I actually do think that the data on our Geraline is pretty decent. So this is a really good option for someone who's already made up their mind that they don't want to do it, or maybe they want to extend their treatment a little bit more. So because I know we're going to get questions about it, is there a brand that you recommend? And then how do you recommend actually incorporate it or incorporating that peptide into your routine? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think that, you know, you know, I launched a brand recently and so, mm-hmm. you know, there's a conflict there and I, I don't have a product that can solve this problem. But the thesis on my brand was that people who became adopters of these single ingredient brands, you know, they were getting the 10% niacinamide and they're getting the, you know, 2% kojic acid products are have now sort of evolved to I want a product that's going to do more for me. And so I have to do less work. So I think people are kind of moving out of that layering. And that was the thesis of my brand, which I took a bunch of actives and I put them in one formula so that it could solve problems like simple for people. Mm-hmm. So that's my thesis, like my thought with with Argerilene as well is like, should you just get an Argerilene product alone, which you can get from the Ordinary or maybe even the Inculus, but I know the Ordinary has a product. Or do you go with something like the one from Peter Thomas Roth, which has not just Argerilene, but a bunch of other peptides like Matrixyl and Matrixyl Synth that are going to have other anti-aging benefits to compound just the Argerilene alone. And that's that's sort of my preference as I'm maturing more into my own skincare routine is I'd rather have single single products that can do more for me. So my recommendation would be something like that. The one from Peter Thomas Roth is a much more interesting product to me at this stage of my routine than, than something like The Ordinary's Argerilene. I love that you mentioned that because this I always say shop for concern, not for ingredient. And I think it shopping by ingredient number one makes your routine a lot longer than it needs to be it's not as effective because you're not you're not getting those products that have more of like a well-rounded approach and then i think you're more likely to experience irritation because what i see with my patients who are shopping by single ingredient they have so many steps so they just end up with a lot of mixing and i would so much rather leave the mixing to the chemists who say this is a great product with these three to four ingredients that are going to be great for your concern rather than trying to do it myself and worry about layering and all that stuff a hundred percent and you know one of the issues right is like with layering is it's kind of like you know it depends like if you like to kind of bake on your own you want to like you you may be somebody who likes to make their own like cocktail of ingredients and it can work really well but even from formulating and this is something i kind of learned later on depending on the ph like certain ingredients start to fall out of formula and one of the issues is if you're laying a bunch of products on top of each other and they're all formulated at different phs and they weren't formulated to be stable together are they going to become less effective if you're layering like five products on top of each other from different brands, all at different pHs? Or are you better off with a product like the one from Peter Thomas Roth, where you know that these ingredients are stable in formula because they've gone through three months of stability testing? So I, I am kind of becoming more and more of a proponent of these single formulas that can do more for you. Yeah, I'm with you on that. So I do want to get to your brand because it's it's so fascinating and you you really have a really interesting take on skincare. But first, I want to cover just a couple more of these TikTok trends. And the next one is diaper rash cream for the face. What do you think about that? Yeah, diaper rash cream for the face. Something we recommend in the office every now and then. Do I find it to be like a universal recommendation for like everyone across the board? I mean, I think that's insane, honestly. I'll tell you kind of like the back. So we use diaper rash cream for diaper rash. And and the reason why we use it um, in babies and why we recommend it all the time is because it's really good at irritant contact dermatitis. So diaper dermatitis essentially is you get all this feces, urine, moisture, friction that causes the skin to break down. And zinc oxide, which is 
the main component of diaper rash creams. And there's also petrolatum in almost every single one as well. They're really good at decreasing the friction and irritation from, from diaper rash. And so the same sort of concept applies to the face. Um, zinc oxide, petrolatum, very good at irritant contact dermatitis. Um, and so anything that's causing irritation, friction on the face, um, it does really, really, really well with. But universally, I, I don't think it's a good recommendation for like the average person. So for the person who I think would benefit from it, somebody who gets like lip lickers, dermatitis, mm -hmm. chelitis on the corners of the lips, somebody who even perioral dermatitis, I think a lot of times can be frictional or it can be due to environmental irritants. And those people, I think it can respond really, really well to people who get irritation on the side of the nose. But I think universally, like I, I like putting this over the entire face, it's, it's heavy, it's occlusive, it will get all over your pillowcase. And on top of that, a lot of these, these creams are, the other ingredients in them are not great for the skin, right? Like if you look at Boudreaux's butt paste, it's got balsam of Peru, which is a very common allergen. If you look at the triple paste cream, it has, I'm trying to think what ingredient in it is um, kind of problematic. Oh, it has lanolin in it, which is, you know, the 2023 contact allergen mm -hmm. of the year, 22 contact allergen of the year, which is an aquaphor. And so I think a lot of people respond well to aquaphor. So I'm not saying it's universally bad, but there's a lot of ingredients in it that you wouldn't want otherwise. So it's not like an equivalent for slugging, like slugging with Vaseline. Vaseline's a single ingredient. It's almost never causes allergy in anyone <laughs> ever. These other formulas, like unless you have a good reason to be using them, I don't think you should be using them all over the face unless you have some really bad irritant contact dermatitis. I think that's a good takeaway about TikTok trends in general. Almost none of them are universal, right? It's all about knowing your skin type and what works for you. So a couple more. You did a video that went viral a little while ago about the triangle of death. Can you explain a little bit about what that is to the audience and how worried should someone really be about it? Yeah, I think your your level of worry for this should be like close to zero. <laughs> like even though we talk about it on social, like, you know, the 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 thesis on it and it's a real thing and, and we've seen it and it happens. I, when I did radiology, it was a much more relevant in radiology than it is even in dermatology because we would see like preceptal cellulitis from mm. or post or orbital cellulitis from these types of infections that would then invade into the brain. So the issue is in the in the triangle of the face, what we call the triangle of death, the vein the venous system is like very short here. And so the communication between any infection in this area can spread more rapidly to the brain and that can cause death, it can cause blindness. And so any infection in this area is higher risk than in other parts of the body. Now what is that risk level if you pop a pimple in the in the center of the face? One of the issues is like if you pop a pimple, it's usually not problematic, but when your hands aren't clean, a lot of people will introduce like staph infections and it's the secondary staph, staph infection, not the acne infection itself, but it's actually like your fingers pressing on a pimple, popping a pimple in this area leads to a staph infection. That staph infection, because of the venous system in the center of the face, spreads rapidly and then you get like some really bad abscess or something that could be life-threatening. But the risk is is very, very low. Like I would say of every million pimples that are popped in the center face, probably one causes this degree of risk. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good to talk about because it's, I, I love these topics, right? Because they are fun on social, but I get so many questions in clinic, as I'm sure you do, very panicked patients when in reality it's, it, it's good to know. I think it's important to know, but also not to freak out about. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, last question, and I think this will translate into your brand pretty well, it sounds like. What do you think about all the content on social media about sebaceous filaments? There's a lot of content on sebaceous filaments, and you know we kind of have a product that can solve that, but I do think people kind of hyper-focus on them. You really have to look really close to people's face to see sebaceous filaments at that level, so I think most people are in the 4X, 10X mirrors mm -hmm. probably a little bit too much. Sebaceous filaments, oil and dead skin cells that build up in your pores, they're the what causes essentially those black dots you, you often see on the nose and the center of the face. And as they build up, they can make your pores look larger. Now, I've had some patients that come in whose sebaceous filaments are so pronounced that you could like feel them on the skin. Like mm -hmm. they're basically like poking out of the skin. Um, and I think in that case, if you want your pores to uh, removing sebaceous filaments is probably the best path in order to make that happen. I also think it makes your layer, your makeup layer better if you remove your sebaceous filaments. But I think I think probably we are a little bit too hyper-focused. As somebody who makes a lot of content on sebaceous filaments and gets tagged in a lot of sebaceous filament <laughs> content, I think people probably hyper-focus on them too much. 
And okay, so for those who it does bother and it's something that they do want to address, what is the best course of action? Yeah, so, you know, I think probably the, if you look at what causes spacious filaments, it's really just like those oil and dead skin cells. So really like controlling oil production, removing oil, and removing those dead skin cells, those dead keratinocytes as they sort of build up in your pores. And so exfoliating helps, retinol helps because it, you know, controls oil production and removes those dead skin cells. And salicylic acid is really good because it removes oil. Niacinamide is really good because it controls oil production. So that was our thought process when I created Remedy for Pore Size. That product specifically has retinol, salicylic acid, niacinamide, green tea, and kyne, and all ingredients that minimize the appearance of pores and also help to control sebaceous filaments. So kind of going back to what you were saying, like this was an idea that instead of like somebody having to buy a retinol, a salicylic acid, and niacinamide, and deciding whether or not they can use those together safely, um, I just put them in one product so people could have simple solutions for their common problems. And is it a serum or is it a lotion or how is it applied? It's more of like a gel okay. cream consistency. And that's true of both of our dark spot treatments. It also has perlite in it, which is a little bit mattifying. I thought a lot of people would probably have a little bit more of oily skin or more sebaceous skin and so they would benefit from the perlite. So it almost has like a mattifying effect like a lot of a lot of mattifying moisturizers do. Nice. So this is going to be a moisturizing product that they'll use. It's both moisturizing and treatment. Yeah. You could put a moisturizer on top of it. You you could opt to not do that, but but I, I kind of like it as like moisturizing over it afterwards even. Yeah, that makes it more universal too because the oily skin types can use it. And then if, if they are trying to treat this area, but they tend to be drier elsewhere on the face, they could still layer a moisturizer on top. This episode is brought to you by, well, me. Skinthusiast.com is your one-stop shop for all things skin, hair, and beauty. I have countless blog posts to educate you on all the skin concerns and most common skin questions I receive. We also have a complete skincare basics guide on our shop page, as well as the cutest in my skin era crewnecks. If you want to support the show, please head over to skinthusiast.com forward slash shop. And don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. So you talked a little bit about Remedy and what your thought process was behind the brand. What, at what point in your career did you think, I'm, I'm set, I'm going to start a brand? And how long did it take you to get here? Yeah, I, I would have never been able to do this if I didn't have the audience on social media. I mean, if I did, it would be 15 years from now. I mean, I think the audience has really helped me accelerate my career in a lot of ways and made it possible to launch a brand because I you know, have, have a built-in audience that I can speak to. I also did a lot of the like market research with the audience. You know, What type of packaging do you like? What type of products are missing in your routines? What, are, what is my audience clicking on? Because I know that that's still a pain point for them when I'm recommending products. So you know, I had all this data that was coming in from the audience, you know, a platform to get the products out to them. So it really only became clear when I started doing social media that this was something that I could do earlier rather than later in my career. And then I saw, I get probably like you, sent tons of skincare products. And I, I almost felt like, why launch a brand if there's so many other products out there? Like, can I really create products with a point of differentiation and so that was like the first challenge because i didn't want to just create products to create products i think there's a lot of great cleansers and moisturizers out there and eventually we'll have those but for me i wanted to like target pain points in the audience that i felt like i could really solve for and so that's why we came out with the initial launch going after more problem solution focused and this was about two and a half years ago and i started with product development first like i went to a, a lab in in california sort of best in class cosmetic chemist there. And I sent them essentially like a brief of what I wanted to work on. Now, this is before I even had a brand name. This is before I had a team at all. And then we kind of built afterwards. So we started with product development first, and then we sort of built the brand around the products. And, you know, we called it Remedy because it's a remedy for <laughs> for common concerns. It's very like on the nose. I didn't, I like what, what, what I remember, and I still like try to hold on to this was, walking into Sephora and seeing these products like named like, you know, the cloud cream moisturizer or, you know, the brilliance moisturizer. And I'm like, I don't know what any of these products are doing for me. I, I just want, you know, better skin. And so that's why we called the products like very specifically what they are. You know, we have like remedy for dark spots. Like you don't need to know anything about skincare to know that this is going to be a remedy for dark spots or a remedy for pore size or remedy for dry lips. And it goes on and on and on. You can kind of guess <laughs> what we'd come out with next based on 
the product naming structure. So the idea was that like you could know right away when you look at the product, like what it's going to do for you. Now, if you're a skin enthusiast like yourself, you can also turn the product over and see like this has got, you know, dark spots has got retinol and mandelic acid and kojic acid and glutathione and licorice root and tranexamic acid, niacinamide, silamare and, and on and on and on. And on. So we put all these ingredients in there for people who are more knowledgeable about skincare, but I also felt like it should be accessible to anyone who doesn't know anything about skincare, who simply wants better skin like I did, you know, five years ago before I knew anything about skincare. I really appreciate that because I think it makes it fun for people who are into skincare, but also very easy for those who are not interested in doing a, a bunch of research on their own and just want something presented to them that's going to actually help solve their problems. And I love that you did the product development first because I think that's probably pretty rare. I'm sure most people have an idea of what it's gonna look like and they have a brand name in their mind and they're already thinking branding before they even have any idea of what kind of formulation they're gonna have. So it really speaks to your creation process and also the intention behind the brand that you went there first. So I, I appreciate that and I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there was a, there's a lot of steps in this process and I'm happy to elaborate at any time, whether privately or, or publicly. Um, there goes a lot and I have a much more appreciation for people who develop brands now because everything is a decision along the way. So it's it's been a long process. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's really exciting to also see it come to fruition and see it out there in the world. And I'm sure people are tagging you in their orders and all that stuff. That's got to be really exciting. It's insane. Like it, it's the greatest feeling in the world to me. Like I, I think probably the coolest. Well, one for one, one like yeah, like having your own products is pretty cool because I take like our dry lip treatment everywhere and I like have it in my pocket everywhere I go. So when I'm applying it, people will say, "Oh, what is that?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's actually it's actually my brand," <laughs> which is like which is pretty cool because it's like the most universal product. But then I think for me, like the biggest thing is like the the reviews that come in. So I mean, we we just launched two weeks ago, but you know we have probably over a hundred reviews already from people just experiencing the products for the first time. And, you know, not all of them are positive as, as you might suspect, but you know, the good ones that come in, um, even the negative ones that come in, like it's good feedback, mm -hmm. um, to like understand like where the pain points are. Um, but overwhelmingly it's been so positive and, you know, people seeing results even, you know, as soon as two weeks, which is, you know, I still want people to give it a little bit of longer time <laughs> to see results. I really believe that. But but yeah, getting the feedback of like positive reviews to me is is that that to me is like really the the my north star. So I think that's the coolest part of it. Absolutely. And tell us a little bit actually about the remedy for dry lips because one of the most common concerns I see especially around this time of year with my patients is the people who are addicted to chapstick and their lips just keep getting more and more dry and irritated. So can you tell us a little bit about why that happens sometimes with traditional chapsticks and how the remedy for dry lips is different and how it targets dry skin? Yeah, so, you know, probably one of the main issues that we see that causes dry lips, it's environmentally, you know, the humidity drops and, you know, people's lips get dry as a, as a result of it. And our lips don't have the same stratum corneum layer of skin that the rest of our face does. So it is more prone to dryness just naturally, inherently. We have patients who are on Accutane, probably you and I both, that that get extremely dry lips from just the effects that Accutane has on sebaceous glands. And so that's where we see like the most extreme form of dry lips is usually on people who are on Accutane. Now, people, they pick up a, a lip balm or a chapstick as a result of this and they say, okay, let me solve this problem for me. And then they get addicted to chapstick. And the reason why is because a lot of these, and they've done allergen studies on lip products specifically, and they've looked at the common allergens in people who come in with lip dermatitis or, or irritation on the lips. And most commonly, these are ingredients that you find in your, your average lip product. So whether it's castor oil <clears throat> or it's fragrance or it's mint or it's uh, some type of flavoring, these are the most common allergens in lip products and on the lips that are causing problems. And so what people do is they get addicted to it because they keep applying it over and over again, solving the product, the problem that the product is actually causing for their skin. Mm -hmm. And so with Remedy for Dry Lips, we removed all of those common allergens um, from the product. Um, and then we put in like really hydrating. We have like a 15% lipid complex, which is a made up of ceramides and shea butter and different oils and esters in it. Um, plus we have ingredients to lock that all in like petrolatum and dimethicone, which are really good skin protectants. And so we put all these ingredients into one basically to create like a lip slugging effect with your lipids plus your occlusives into one formula. So it really is meant more as a lip repair treatment than 
like a lip decoration. So it's not lip decoration like a lot of the peptide treatments mm -hmm. and um, glossy lip products and colored lip products that you see out there. It really is meant more for repair. Um, so I, some people even will like use it as their base layer and apply like the road lip peptide treatment over it so mm -hmm. that they can get both the hydration effect, but also that glossy effect. I don't think you need to do that, but you certainly can do that. And Dr. Bonasali helped formulate road, who is my partner in the New York office. I'm glad that you touched on that a little bit because I think every brand has a lip treatment product now. I think even the cosmetic brands have kind of, when they're formulating a lip product, they're steering even more away from color cosmetics and into like the lip, lip treatment. But we know that many of them are just beneficial temporarily and there's not really that long-term benefit. So I'm glad that you touched on that because I think sometimes people think, oh, like, of course they added a lip product, but it is really intentional. There's a reason behind it and it really is solving a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And the demand for the lip product has been like way more than I even anticipated. You know, to me, this was just something I like created for myself because I have dry lips and mm -hmm. I was frustrated with what I was putting on my lips. And so I was like, oh, let me make this. And, you know, maybe a few people will like it, uh, but it's been like an overwhelming success. And so we're probably going to sell out of this product. And so that and we, we can have a a very long discussion about the benefits and downsides of selling out of products. Mm -hmm. The downsides actually kind of are, are are more than I think people anticipate because it really, it kind of really wrecks your like e-com company if you're out of a product that's in demand. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it's, I've talked to many brand founders, a lot of new brand founders on here and inventory is always difficult. I think it has to be hard to decide when you're placing these orders, how much to invest in it initially before before you've tested, you know, the concept in the world. So, but it's also it has to be exciting because you see the demand, but you have that kind of balance. Yeah, you know, there's, the, I think a lot of times brand founders and they, they kind of get attached to the idea of a product that they created. And, you know, I, I can see myself being the same way because you put a lot of time into a product. But the truth is the market is going to decide, the consumer is going to decide whether or not they like that product or they have a place for that product in their routine. And so that that product market fit is really decided by the people. And so you can't get too attached to the idea that, you know, your product should be great and everyone should love it. And so, you know, for us, like, you know, we hypothesized that dark spots would be our hero product. I had all this data coming in that from my audience that this was a pain point for them. So I kind of knew that it, w that it would do okay. But um, there are things like, you know, that don't perform as well or overperform and you really just have no idea. I don't know if you know, uh, ben Bennett at all. He's mm -hmm. um, from the center and mm -hmm. he did Naturium and Prequel um, and many other brands. And he's he's somewhat of a genius. Um, and, uh, you know, he always, he, he said to me early on that, you know, you can't get attached t to your products because the, the people are going to decide essentially whether or not there's a fit for them. And so for me, I've, I've tried to remain nimble in that way. And, but when you have an audience, you have no idea like how many people are going to buy the product. So I think that initial order for us was like a really hard decision. I think now that we have data on how fast things are moving, we'll have better idea of like what quantities to order next. So the first was just like shot in the dark. I think now that we have data, we'll know like how much of each to reorder and what to order for our next launches. So yeah, like it was, it was chaotic at first, but now I think we have a good idea of like mm -hmm. the reception. That's really good advice too, for anybody who's thinking about starting a brand in any, in any aspect, you know, just not getting too attached to what you think is is going to be your hero and would you say that the lip product is a good place to start for somebody who's new to the brand yeah i i think the lip product is the most universal product right mm -hmm. so like pretty much anybody will benefit and take to this product you know not everyone's gonna look because everyone has different you know opinions about texture but you know this is the product where i would say like if you don't have dark spots or large pores um, and sebaceous filaments, then you don't really have a need for the other two products. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not combating discoloration, uneven skin tone, then you know these products, products are probably not best for you. But dry lips is something I think that everyone will enjoy. So it's probably a good start if you don't have any of the other two issues. Okay, good to know. And we had a lot of audience questions come in for you specifically, probably more than I've ever received. So we're not gonna be able to get through them all, but I would love to ask you just a few of them that came up repeatedly. And one was, can peptide serums be used with Remedy? I think sometimes there's a lot of confusion about what can and can't be used with peptides. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, so peptide serums can be used. Peptides are relatively stable ingredients overall because they're just like chains of amino acids. And so overall, they're pretty stable in most formulations. And so you could use your peptide serum with Remedy. Perfect. Next question, what are your thoughts on vitamin C serums for those who have acne? Yeah, there was like one study. I can't remember which formulation of vitamin C this is. It might be like sodium ascorbyl phosphate that showed that it has like some benefit in in, in acne actually, like in treating acne. I, I, overall, I don't think vitamin C is a good acne ingredient by mm -hmm. any means. I, I think vitamin C is a pretty polarizing ingredient overall because I think when I talk to my patients, there are people who swear by it. Like they use vitamin C and it's the best thing that's ever happened to their skin. Or you talk to people and they're like, I've never found or tried a vitamin C that did not irritate my skin, mm -hmm. cause me to break out worse and cause worsening irritation on my skin. So I think for most people, like you really have to try vitamin C, especially the L-ascorbic acid form and see if that pH and concentration does well for your skin. I always say that it doesn't do very well for my skin unless it's formulated like a very specific way. Um, like I don't do well with the SkinCeuticals vitamin C personally. Mm -hmm. I do better with their like Silymarin version of that um, product. So you really have to like try and test. What are your thoughts on vitamin C? I, I love vitamin C. I think two things. I think one, there's a lot of high expectations when it comes to vitamin C. I think people think it's going to brighten their discoloration in one bottle. And I always say that skin brightening to me is like the least exciting thing that vitamin C does. I don't really use it to brighten my skin. I use other ingredients for that. I really use it for like the long-term collagen benefits and the antioxidant protection, all of that stuff. But I too find I have sensitive skin. I I don't use a lot of L-ascorbic acid. I tend to lean more towards the lipid soluble forms. And I do find that for my patients who have, you know, those people who are like, I've never been able to use a vitamin C serum, I do find the majority of them can tolerate a lipid soluble, like a THD ascorbate or something like that. So that's usually my go-to. And I'm excited that more and more brands are starting to use that ingredient. I always tell people if your skin is resistant and you're not sensitive, go to L-ascorbic acid because we just have so much data on it. But if it is, I usually encourage them to try a lipid soluble derivative. Yeah, 100%. And there's a bunch of new ones coming out that are I mean, the main thing is that like if it's lipid soluble, it needs to get to the skin and then it mm. needs to convert into L-ascorbic mm -hmm. acid, which a lot of these lipid soluble forms do. And, you know, the yeah. active composition that actually gets into the dermis is actually pretty high. So, so yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you. Um, I'd like to see more data on the lipid soluble ones because I think that it should really be keeping L-ascorbic acid a run for its money because L-ascorbic acid really is intolerable by a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's going to be really exciting to see that data in the next five to 10 years as more and more brands pay for those studies because I do think it has the potential to kind of sideline L-ascorbic acid in a lot of ways. So it'll be interesting to see. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are your thoughts on microneedling in combination with minoxidil for hair loss? I'm actually interested in this too because I think there's two camps on whether or not you should microneedle the scalp. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. It's a good question. You know, so I, we do hair transplants in New York. So we deal with probably the best and worst of it all. Mm -hmm. The data is pretty strong on microneedling plus minoxidil. You know, the, one of the issues with any product topically is uh, penetration into the skin. Now, microneedling may have other benefits, like it may stimulate collagen production. It may stimulate, you know, wound healing mechanisms, blood flow that are beneficial to the scalp. But it also just simply will help the penetration of minoxidil and any topical formulations into the scalp. Good data suggests that it works well. Now, is it good or bad? Is it bad to, there was there was once a, a company in it, it never went to market essentially, but they had some good data on it. It was called Folica, and it was essentially a, a microneedling product for the scalp. Um, it was going to, it was going like the FDA route. They were going to like really try to make it like a thing. Um, it, it never ended up working out, but they had good data that suggested that it was beneficial and wasn't damaging to the hair follicles. Now, most of the hair follicles and the stem cells of the hair follicle are pretty deep, deeper into the skin. And so if you're, if you're microneedling with something that's 0.25 or 0.5, you're probably not going to get down low enough to cause any damage. And I asked the same question to probably one of the top hair transplant surgeons in, in the countries from Texas. And he basically said, like, I was like, what, are you worried about microneedling you know, causing any damage to like the collagen layer of the skin, making it more difficult to do transplants and more difficult to the scalp later on. And he was like, no, like you would have to go really, really deep for it to cause any problems. And so like this kind of shallow microneedling, like you don't want to be doing like two millimeters, like really like eight millimeter depth yeah. on the scalp. But if you're doing like 0 0.5, 0 0.25, you really aren't going deep enough to cause any damage to the hair follicles themselves. 
Do you guys do any PRP for hair loss in your clinic? We do PRP. I always tell, I'm very honest with people in the office. You know, I tell people like it's hit or miss. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't really try to sell miracles to people. Mm -hmm. I, I look at hair loss in like a garden truly that there are many things that can make your garden grow. And you probably need a little bit of all of them to have the best garden in the world. But do I consider, you know, I always say like sunlight, like for su sunlight and water are critical for like a plant to grow. And I think that minoxidil and finasteride for men fall more in that category of like the sunlight and water. Whereas like your, your PRP is more like fertilizer where it's like going to probably help, but you know, kind of hit or miss. Mm -hmm. So I say with PRP, it's like 50% see really good results with it because it's like fertilizer for your hair but i don't consider it to be like an essential an essential for like a hair growth regimen yeah it's on we do the same where we really approach it as a combination treatment it's not something i usually ever recommend alone definitely mm -hmm. okay so there was one question someone listened to a doctor on another podcast who said lasers can cause damage and aging rather than treat it what are your thoughts on that? And that's very broad, very broad comment. But if you can give us a little advice for those who maybe were scared off by this comment. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough. You know, there's always side effects with any procedure that you do. Now, I think RF microneedling is going through their, you know, negative PR time. I think, you know, Ulthera, Thermage, like any of these sort of like heat devices, people will claim that they m melt your fat. And uh, they certainly can if you go deep enough or if Ulthera is not targeted at that fascial layer properly. I think overall, you know, most lasers, if done correctly, and you go to someone who knows what they're doing and is thoughtful about their approach and is trained well on these devices, it's overall going to have like, I, I think lasers are truly underrated, like especially when we're talking about skincare to when we're talking to like mass audiences, you know, select audiences are know, know of their capabilities, but um, lasers are incredibly powerful um and they can do probably more for your skin than anything else that we've talked about um e even even botox like fillers topical skincare like oh, those are foundational to a skincare routine but like what you can do with like a powerful laser like a you know fraxel or co2 or halo i mean the, uh, the you can do incredible things to the skin with these these devices and so i think i Short answer is that yes, you can get you can get like side effects that could make aging look worse if a device is used incorrectly. But in the right hands, lasers are some of the most powerful things you can do for anti aging. Yeah, it's usually not the device; it's usually the technician, right? Whether or not you have a result that you're happy with, and of course, things can happen in pre and post care that are out of our control. But for the most part, they're largely safe in the right hands. Absolutely. Okay, so someone asked. She says she breaks out with niacinamide. What can I use for con to control sebum? I'd love to hear your thoughts on irritation and breakouts with niacinamide. And then the second part of the question, if they truly can't use it, what can they use to control sebum? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's probably about one study on niacinamide sebum control, maybe two. I think it was like in an Asian population, maybe South Korea. You know, I think with sebum production, you know, niacinamide does a good job. Retinol does a good job. Green tea has actually some studies as well. And I think L-carnitine can help control azelaic acid even one study shows it can help control oil production as well you know i think probably better off like with moisturizers that can absorb oil because then you don't have to worry so much about the ingredient actually controlling sebaceous output but those are some other ingredients you can use if you don't tolerate niacinamide well but let's but th that's what i would say but but ask your question about niacinamide because i think you're i know where you're going with this well i'm just curious your thoughts because i i find that when people have a problem with niacinamide it's dose dependent so either it's too in too high of a concentration because now brands are you know they love to to tout how much of a of a concentration of an ingredient is on in their product. So they're going higher and higher, higher than maybe we need. And it's also in a lot of products. So people are using it in their sunscreen and their moisturizer. And then they're also using a niacinamide serum. So that's what I usually find. I find that once they pair back and just stick to one product that has a decent concentration, they can tolerate it. But I'd love to see what your experience has been. Uh, I 100% agree with you. Um, I think there there there's this concept from both skincare brands and consumers alike that the more is better and more is not necessarily better especially when it comes to like concentrations of actives so niacinamide is a really great ingredient and even like so our remedy for dark spots remedy for pore size both has niacinamide and we got we got a few comments that definitely said 
I wish this product didn't have niacinamide in it because my skin doesn't tolerate niacinamide. And I, I think that's probably true for some people, especially so many people have tried niacinamide products over the last three years. Whatever percentage cannot tolerate niacinamide, we figured those, like those people know who they are now mm -hmm. because there's almost no way that you escape niacinamide over the last yeah. At the last three years. So um, I still think it's probably a very low percentage of people because um, it's a really well tolerated ingredient. And I, I completely agree. It's probably percentage dependent. Uh, you know, we see 10%, 12%, 20% mm -hmm. niacinamide. We made a YouTube video three years ago where we deep dived on niacinamide. This is back when I first started creating content. And I lo we looked at all the studies on niacinamide at the time. And I probably need to do an update soon. But at the time, like, the maximum concentration we saw in any study was 5%. So it was 2 to 5% in almost every clinical study that had ever been shown benefits of niacinamide. But then I was looking at the market. I'm like, there's, you can't even find a 5% niacinamide serum. Like you can only find like 10%, yeah, 20%. Uh, so, so short answer, 5% uh, niacinamide or less mm -hmm. is sort of the concentration you want to look for. And if you can tolerate lower percentages of, of niacinamide, it's probably not the ingredient and more of these like mega dose concentrations you're seeing from skincare brands. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so to wrap up, I always like to ask all my guests, what is your holy grail skincare product if you had to pick one? Oof, my holy grail skincare product is probably the CeraVe Cream to Foam Cleanser. Okay. It's probably the one I've used the most consistently. And then probably Alta MD UV Restore Sunscreen. And oh, I love Restore. I love that one. Restore is incredible. My favorite product from the skin, my skincare brand, Remedy for Dark Spots, is for dark el spots. is elite. And how are you using that? Like, do you use it once a day? Uh, remedy for Dark Spots. Yeah. Uh, once or a day at night. Okay. Um, so cleanse, apply Remedy for Dark Spots, moisturize at night. That should be your entire night routine for uneven skin tone. Because that one already has a retinol in it, right? It's got retinol. It's, it's got amazing. everything. Yeah. All in one. <laughs> All okay. in one. So what is your most underrated skincare tip? Something that you don't see many people talk about that you think is underrated. Hmm. I don't know. This is probably going to sound a little bit generic. Probably just switching out like your pillowcases and towels frequently. It, it makes such a big difference. I think people don't realize how much colonization bacteria occurs especially on your towels, even after like using them once or twice. So I think that's an easy and cheap way to, to improve your skin is just, you know, changing out those things that come in contact with your face. Okay. So probably towels after each use, especially on the face, but how often do you change your pillowcase? Me personally, probably mm -hmm. like once a week, um, mm -hmm. more could be better. Um, but I do wash my face right before I go to bed, yeah. but I also have like all this hair product that I don't wash out yeah. and then it's like on my pillow and then it's on my face. But the biggest difference for me was not on my face, but it was on my back. I have like incurable back acne. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did many things to improve it and it seemed to always come back until I started to change out my, my bed sheets like once a week which you should probably do anyway. But as a guy, I wasn't, on top of it. <laughs> I wasn't on top of it. That made a huge difference in my back acne. Oh, that's a great tip. Okay. Yeah. Very last question. If you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Probably wouldn't even be skincare related. I got skin cancer from tanning booths. So, you know, oh, really? Uh, so I used to go tanning all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in New York. I was part of the gym tan laundry age group. Mm -hmm. um, I used to go tanning all the time, got skin cancer from tanning booths. So Obviously, you know, don't go tanning like I did. Skincare tip, wear sunscreen, probably the best thing that you can do for your skin. Life advice to me would be everyone you meet, anything that you do in life, everything matters to some extent. Be the best you can be anywhere you go. Treat people kindly. Be generous to people. You have no idea where life is going to lead you. But I think ultimately those things, like the times I was, the people who've come back into my life years later to help me that I never thought I never wanted anything from them or expected anything from them. But I think being good, to, kind to people and generous to people, empathetic to people throughout your life, like is always going to be something that's going to come back and help you. I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We're going to leave links to Remedy and some of the other products you mentioned below. And what's a good place for everyone to find you? So at Dr. Lee on Instagram, at Dr. Lee YouTube, at Derm Doctor on TikTok. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. So thanks so much for taking the time. I know the audience is going to love this one. I hope you all enjoyed that episode with Dr. Shaw. You can find him at Derm Doctor on TikTok or at Dr. Lee on Instagram or YouTube. 
You can also find him at Hudson Dermatology in New York City if you are looking for a dermatologist in the area. We are also gonna be giving away five of the Remedy for Dry Lips. So all you have to do is follow both me and Dr. Lee on Instagram and let us know in the reel that I posted about this podcast what your biggest takeaway from, was from this episode and we're gonna pick five winners to win the Remedy for Dry Lips. So thank you for tuning in and I will talk to you next week's enthusiasts.